In this spooky episode of Pop Culture Weekly, it's Halloween. I talk with Michael Myers himself, Nick Castle, and Ray herself from the galaxy far, far away. Daisy Ridley, let's go! Welcome to Pop Culture Weekly with Kyle McMahon from iHeartRadio. Your pop culture news, views, reviews, and celebrity interviews on all the movies, TV, music, and pop culture you crave weekly. Here's Kyle McMahon. Nick. Na, na, na. Hello and welcome to Pop Culture Weekly with Kyle McMahon. I, of course, am Kyle McMahon and it is another October episode. That means Halloween. You know, that's my favorite day of the year. It's my favorite time of the year. I love horror. I love uh, spooky season. And this month, I feel like we've been bringing all the great you know, spooky people out, uh, spooky content, horror movies, thrillers, just, you know, getting it all up. Last episode, we had Bruce Campbell, who's so amazing. Um, we talked about Hysteria and Teacup, which is this terrifying series on Peacock. It's just been, oh, and Caddo Lake, the M. Night Shyamalan produced film that I talked with Dylan O'Brien and Eliza Scanlon. Such, just such great content. And this episode is no different. I talk with, the shape himself, the original OG, Michael Myers. Yes, I talk with Nick Castle all about Halloween, which is out in theaters right now with a couple of the sequels as well. And then I talk with Ray, Daisy Ridley. Yes, Daisy Ridley. I talk about her brand new film called Magpie, which is really, really, really creepy and really, really, really good. You're going to love it. But we'll talk about that in a moment. First up, let's get right into my interview with the one and only Nick Castle, who gives us a very cool exclusive on the future of the Halloween franchise. Here he is, Nick Castle. So is this like your busy time of the year? I mean, obviously you're busy all year, but is this like a, an insane time for you? Well, you know, uh, I'm not busy all year. I'm a retired motion picture director, writer, and having a wonderful time in retirement. Uh, but nonetheless, what I do do is go to a lot of horror conventions, uh, fan conventions, and especially this time of year is a very popular. Over the last eight weeks, I've gone to six different cities just oh. to talk to the fans, and they have a blast with this character, signing autographs and masks and knives and all kinds of stuff. So I, I have the pleasure and the privilege of, of, of being a uh, uh, an ambassador for for John's movie and uh, for for a, a lot of the other uh, uh, a lot of the other films uh, that have been spawned by, by this character. Yeah, I mean, Halloween is such an iconic film, the franchise. I, you know, I'm a huge horror fan. I'm a huge Halloween fan. Um, Halloween is my favorite. It's the OG for me. Um, what is it like to be, you know, I mean, you are the shape, Michael Myers. What is it like to be that character in, in a film that has just through decades endured? Well, you know, it's... It, it's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> I find it ironic because, you know, what I'll be remembered for is this movie after having done a dozen movies or writing another three or four. But but uh, it, it's it's so much fun because you get to meet the fans uh, at these conventions, and uh, that's how I know uh, how, uh, how beloved in its own strange way this character is, uh, meeting people that actually are affected by this, that their first movie was uh, Halloween, or their first horror movie where they sat down with their parents and watched it, and they remember it fondly for that. So it's almost like a family affair. And of course, it happens every year. It was brilliantly uh, you know, titled Halloween, so every every year around this time, you're reminded not only of the season, but of this little movie that was done so well that you, you don't mind going back to it over and over again. Yeah. And and for for you, you know, over these decades, when you look back 1977, 1978, did you ever think that this was going to, you know, that you'd be talking about it 40 some years later? 
<laughs> Absolutely not. You know, at the time, uh, this was uh, a little film that you hoped would get, uh, you know, decent uh, distribution and uh, that you hoped John would get another job from. Right. That's what I was hoping. <laughs> and, let, and within the, the, the year, it was the largest grossing independent film of all time. Uh, and uh, especially for the budget, was uh, was is a crazy reality. And so, uh, uh, no, no idea. And you've talked about, um, you, you know, you've talked about the film so much. Uh, is there anything that you know is little known about? You know, a little known fact about the film that, that you haven't maybe been asked about or haven't discussed? Oh dear, you know, yes, I've. They've, uh, Folks like you have mined pretty much everything out of this brain. <laughs> uh, the, the one thing I like to remind people of is the uh, is the partnership that John had with Deborah Hill, the mm. producer and co-writer of the picture, uh, was uh, no small part in making this thing uh, uh, a reality and making it so good. She she helped uh, work with the uh, young actresses on the set, uh, and like I said, co-wrote it with him and. Uh, was a, a tremendous uh, uh, talent. Uh, died too young and didn't get to have a, as much of the fun of these last decades of of how how, how the movie has grown in in uh, in fan base uh, exponentially. It seems almost year after year. So uh, I tribute. It's just a reminder to folks that there was a woman involved with this this show that that had a lot to do with this, its success. I love that so much. And, you know, Halloween is playing right now in, what, nearly 800 theaters across the country. It's not every movie that gets that gets a re-release, you know, like that, especially decades later. Um, is, is, you know, for you, you also did... The, the thing that I love about, you know, a franchise like Halloween is that then you have different takes on it. You know, Rob Zombie did a take on it, and um, and then the recent trilogy uh, from um, from David Gordon Green, uh, which which you were in. Um, do you enjoy seeing the different, you know, and then there's, there's books and games and comic books and all that. Do you enjoy seeing the, the different kind of, you know, creative takes on, on the franchise? Oh yes, I mean, I, I, in fact, I wouldn't mind seeing more of them. I'd love to see a film, a, do an episode each from a great filmmaker to do their own Michael Myers, mm. like Rob tried and did, and, and uh, David Gordon Green. Uh, you know, he came up with the concepts of doing a forty years later one and and how to approach it. I thought that was magnificently done. And then talking about um, artistic endeavors. There are even books now of people that have done uh, artwork that uh, include the, the movie or the character that are just spectacular, that are uh, beautifully done. So uh, the movie has inspired a lot of artists, and, uh, and you can see it in, uh, in, in when I go, to, especially when I go to these conventions where people will bring posters of things that people have made out of, you know, from their homes. You know, there's just spectacular work and uh it's 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 really quite remarkable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And do you happen to have any um, any idea where you know is there talk of a of a bringing another film out? Oh yeah, I spoke to um, Malik Akkad, uh, who is uh, uh, the uh, uh, the owner of the franchise. Oh, they're busy trying to figure out the next next uh, uh, the next iteration. And of course, I think he's talked about uh, having a relationship with Miramax, and they're re- thinking maybe TV might be the next step. I don't know what that means exactly, but uh, that might be the next time uh, you see the Halloween world uh, um, uh, pop out. I love that. And originally, wasn't John's original idea was to do like each year would be it wouldn't be necessarily Michael Myers. But it would be a different story taking place on Halloween. Is that true? That was true. I, you know, in fact, uh, the third iteration of Halloween that John did was Halloween three, season of the witch, which didn't have Michael Myers. Uh, had a great story at the time. It was it was uh, it didn't work for the audience because the promotion of it didn't really explain that this wasn't Michael Myers. So everyone was disappointed when they went to see it, or many people were. 
And now, years and years and years later, having, you know, that behind him, that movie, directed by Tommy Lee Wallace, uh, uh, is, is a big fan favorite. So, yeah, I think if you promoted it right, an anthology series about using John as the mastermind of, uh, of the series and, and promoting it and, and shaping it, would be a great way of, uh, of of telling the stories again. Yeah, for sure. Maybe that ties in with uh, you know a television type thing, and then you have Michael yeah. Myers, whatever, each season finale or something. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> I think we're, we may steal that idea from you. It's yours. I just want more Halloween content. Uh, <laughs> Nick, you you know you've done so much work. August Rush is a personal favorite. I love that film. It's such a meditation for me. I believe in music and film and familial 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 ties. Um, do you find you know you've done such varied work? Do you find that as an artist, that's kind of you know what kept you going for so long that you were able to do a Halloween and then an August Rush and a Mister wrong and that sort of thing well sometimes you make your career and sometimes your career makes you mm -hmm. for john for instance he was very clear about uh, producing a john carpenter movie for me it was like you know it wasn't as easy as uh, not, it, not that it was easy but uh it, it didn't fall that way it was like who had the best script what studio wanted to hire me things of that nature so that you know you you get this kind of eclectic uh, you know, career that uh, that I, I've had a ball with. So it's uh, it's not formed <laughs> into uh, you know uh, uh, that uh, the kind of world that John was able to create, but it's a world that I I've enjoyed every minute of and uh, and had some great luck with doing films that I generated from my own little brain to m motion pictures that were handed to me that I just loved the idea. Of. So. I've been lucky, and uh, now in retirement, I can look back and just promote my friends' movies like this. I, I love that so much. Nick, thank you so much. People can go to HalloweenPortal.com and get all of the information, and they can go, like me, and go see Halloween and a few of the sequels as well in theaters on the big screen. Thank you so much, Nick. I really appreciate it. Thank you, and happy Halloween to your, the folks there. Thank you, sir. You as well. Nick Castle. I can't believe I talked to Michael Myers. This has been like a dream this month. Bruce, Bruce Campbell, last episode. Michael Myers, you know, Nick Castle, this episode. Just so awesome. I'm like living my dream, and you guys make it happen, and I appreciate that and love that. From you and for you and for me. Thank you. Uh, it's awesome because he directed also like The Last Starfighter, which is such a great movie. And Dennis the Menace, which was hilarious. That came out in, what, 93? And it had uh, Walter Matthau and Christopher Lloyd in it. Like, what a cast. Natasha Leone, Leah Thompson. So, anyway. All right. We're going to take a super short break. So, hang out here so hang out here with me and support our sponsors who make this show happen. I will see you in 60. All right. Thank you for hanging out with me and supporting our sponsors who make this show happen every single week and bring you amazing interviews like Nick Castle, Michael freaking Myers, and this next interview who I am so excited about. My next guest has captivated audiences around the globe with her incredible talent and charisma. She has empowered people, especially women and girls, around the galaxy with her breakout role as Rey in the blockbuster Star Wars sequel trilogy. And she's proven herself to be a force to be reckoned with in Hollywood and beyond. And her new film, Magpie, is an incredible, twisty, turny, Hitchcockian thriller that she conceived of herself and now stars in. Let's talk with Daisy Ridley. So, first of all, Daisy, thank you so much for speaking with me. I really appreciate it. Magpie is so good. I love it. 
Thank you. Of course. So uh, tell me about, you know, from my understanding, this film came from you. The idea for it came while you were filming something else. Uh, which I think is so meta, especially with the um, the film itself. How how did that come about for you? So the actual original idea was a little different to where Tom ended up taking it. The original idea was um, if uh, an actress is away from home and destabilized by something and does not have the solidity of sort of a bedrock of uh, something keeping her feeling calm i mean being away filming anyway even with all of those things and the stability can be very strange and very isolating and often you're away from home so the original uh concept was what would uh, an actress do if she became so in love with the child that was playing her child she tried to infiltrate that family so that was the original um idea and when tom started working on it um he just said he felt really more drawn to the woman at home who is the person who um, isn't able to go and have this amazing experience on set where these intimate bonds are formed incredibly quickly and everything feels exciting and fresh. And who is she and how is she coping with the feeling of being the other woman in terms of her child? And then, of course, coupled with that, her husband has a wandering eye. Yeah. <laughs> and for so, you know, this this kind of uh, incubates with you and you decide, you know, there's something here that I, I want to do with it. So you took it to a producer friend of yours and it kind of blossomed from there, right? Yeah. So me and Tom had already started um, spitballing and he had actually written, I mean, it, he wrote incredibly quickly because we were so excited about um, the idea and particularly when he started working on it. And and I knew his writing anyway. I've read a lot of his other scripts, which are beautiful. So we pitched it to Kate, who um, I produced the movie with. And um, she was very interested. And then um, away we went. So things, you know, shifted as we went. Um, But certainly the idea was there. And then we knew we wanted a killer ending. Um, And then Tom really sculpted that um, because we had there had to be enough layers between everyone. And you had to believe those relationships and you had to care about these people and what happened in order for us to pull that off. So all of that uh, was built by him. I I love that. And part of what I love is it's so, um, in its own way, Hitchcockian almost. Um, and I'm a huge Hitchcock fan. Uh, are, are, you, um, are you a Hitchcock fan? And does that kind of play into when you're doing, you know, different projects, especially when you're producing and you're, you're so involved in the development of, um, is that something like, you know, conscious for you? Like, you know, I want to kind of do something in this vein or that vein. Well, we had inspirations um, from the beginning. Um, One was Tully, Mm -hmm. this amazing film with Charlize Theron. We had seen Homecoming, the show with Julia Roberts with that very claustrophobic Zoom. Um, So there had been references anyway. And we really, me and Tom really wanted to make the sort of film that, and we all love all sorts of films, but something that, uh, we would really want to see. So the genre feeling and that noir feeling was something we always wanted. But we were also incredibly lucky to have Sam Yates come on board as director and Laura Bellingham come on as DOP. And we had talked about uh, Hitchcock and Sam's big inspiration was John Demi. Um, and a big reference was Silence of the Lambs. Mm. Uh, and so when you have amazing people who you trust, and our production designer, Amanda McCarthy, is just f- phenomenal. So because we had this amazing crew, I was able to sit back and then be blown away by the work that they were doing. And of course, we were all involved in those conversations. But the minute they started um, spitballing their ideas together and they did the shot list and how they were going to capture it, it was just brilliant. And even on set, watching scenes come together before they're edited, before anything, the way Laura was capturing everything was so gorgeous and gives that feeling of what is going on we're seeing things that we shouldn't be seeing and we're not seeing things that we should be seeing where's that line and where's the line between what's real and what's not but really yeah so much of that is down to laura and for for you you know um i'm not sure you know often for those watching or listening uh films and projects are filmed out of order and i'm trying to be as 
uh, spoiler free as possible. Um, is it hard for you? Uh, and, and I would assume that's a little bit easier for you since you were involved since the beginning. But is it hard for you as you're filming when you're doing sequences out of order to kind of be like, OK, Annette is in this space for this scene mm-hmm. uh, and then she's in that space for that. Scene. You know what I'm saying? Um, yes. Uh, certainly we did the first, uh, chunk of the shoot was all in the house, but we did it as chronologically as possible. So even Mm. within the house, she has an emotional journey of that real claustrophobic feeling, feeling at the beginning. And then the end of the movie where she's a lot more calm and she is holding the cards at that point. Um, so, uh, there were moments where I can't remember what scene we, we did a big leap. We did a, we, we did, went from scene, I don't know, scene 50 to scene 90. I thought. <laughs> um, but also again, to Sam's credit, I mean, we talked before every scene about where Annette was and having a director you really trust, um, is fantastic because I also wasn't watching the dailies of myself. I was only watching the other people do scenes because that was something I felt would be too difficult so when you trust people and are like, is this coming across? Is this the right thing? Um, uh, yeah. So there was one time where it was a bit of a leap. And I thought, oh, okay. And that is, and that is slightly different here. But the amazing thing is too, she is never broken. She's really beaten and really bruised emotionally, but she's never broken. And the strength, and we meet her and Ben in a difficult time. We never see them as they were. Mm-hmm. We come into their relationship mid difficulty. So we had already established that. And from there, I mean, things get worse for Annette before they get better. But she always maintains that she has her kids to think about. And they're really the motivation for her drive. And because as well, they have these beautiful kids to film with and here, but particularly who plays Matilda she her little face was such a drive for me too that that kept me centered in it all as well i love that and finally you know and i've asked uh robert pattinson this and i've asked daniel radcliffe this when you do you know when you do such an iconic character in a giant franchise like ray and then you go and do these projects that are on the opposite kind of scale does Mm. is that super fulfill like like i feel like as a creator, you know, obviously I'm not an actor, but I feel like as a creator, it kind of like checks all these marks in the fact that like I can go and do this giant project and then that affords me to go and do kind of anything I want. Do you find that true for you? In terms of being afforded the the privilege, absolutely. Because I also know without the bigger films, it would be more difficult to make the smaller films, which is just the truth of it. Um, but it's interesting in terms of approach, I feel the same in Mm. approaching every role. Um, and it's certainly different going from shooting 140 days to shooting for 23 days, but I feel really genuinely blessed with the people that I've got to work with. And ultimately art is art, whether it's your main big movie, uh, that's going to be seen on an IMAX or a smaller movie that you hope will connect with people. Um, either way, uh, you know, you hope that the emotional story will connect either way. You hope the, the vista of it all will connect. Um, so the, in terms of approach, it doesn't change, but my hope always is, I mean, that I become a better actor each time to be honest too, but also that, um, uh, each film, even if it means something to one person, whether it means something to a hundred people or one person, that one person is as important. Um, so the hope would always be that whatever it is I'm making connects in some way. I love that so much, Daisy. Daisy, it connected with me. I can't wait till it comes out so I can talk about it with people. Magpie exclusively coming out in theaters. I can't wait for everybody to see it. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Daisy Ridley, I cannot believe that I talked with Ray. Daisy Ridley, Ray, Star Wars: The Force Awakens, Star Wars: The Last Jedi, Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker. I mean, I Daisy Ridley, people, Daisy freaking Ridley. I'm like pinching myself. And this episode, I also talked with Nick Castle. 
Michael Myers himself, like, what is going on in my life? I love you guys for being with me and supporting me. Uh, you know, watch the videos if you want. The video version of the interviews are up on the website and Facebook and all that good stuff. Keep tuned in with the podcast, obviously. We're going to be doing some cool giveaways coming up soon, just in time for the holidays, and so much more coming to you, all because of you, and I love you for that. All right. I will see you next week. I love you. We out. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Weekly. Hear all the latest at popcultureweekly.com. Ray, 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 Ray,